I like peanut butter. I like peanut butter. Peanut, peanut butter. You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. I like peanut butter. I Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Yeah, it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode number 110. Mysteries of the Appalachian Trail and Sasquatch in the Carolinas. That is correct. I see a little note that you put that says, Tense does not match the aforementioned question. I don't know what that means. So there you go. So what is this podcast all about? <laughs> this podcast is about broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our Creep Geeks bunker studio in the western mountains of the Appalachians and North Carolina, because I don't know what that means. <laughs> what the hell does tense does not mention, does not match the aforementioned question. I have to know. What is that? What is object? And then you start with a verb of something what, within Is this object. English stuff? Yes, it is. Okay, then what should it say? What are the Creep Geeks podcast? No. <laughs> that makes it worse. Well, then what do you, I don't know what I need to do at this particular point. Except to say that in the mountains of Western North Carolina, there is a podcast that broadcasts paranormal news and weird news, offbeat news, right? A podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the strange, the stupid, the paranormal tech topics and things like that that are circulating the web. You know? You know, the listeners It's brought are- to you by two genuine people. Me, Greg, and you, Omi. And we do it. Out the kindness of our hearts. <laughs> we try as hard as we can. It's an organic podcast, right? Coming back off a forced vacation where one of us was sick as two dogs. That's my native name. How do two dogs? Sick as two <laughs> dogs. Not just sick as a dog, but sick as two dogs. That doesn't make sense. Neither does the aforementioned po- question <laughs> doesn't. I'm like, what is that? Okay. The tense of the question. Well, if anybody knows the answer to the tense of the question matches the aforementioned question, they won't know because they don't see our show notes. At one, yes, they do see our show notes. Our show notes. See that one? Yeah, they're copied and pasted, (laughs) right? With all the links and everything we talk about. If you go to creepgeeks.com, when you see one of the podcasts up and you click it, it shows you all the links and all the notes and stuff that we used when we do the show. You know. So if you go, hey, I wonder, and you can say, there it is. There's the link. They click on it, and they can learn. And then that's good. That's a good thing, right? And they also see links like if you want to subscribe on YouTube to watch our live stream podcast when we do that, there's a link for that. There's a link to our website, creepgeeks.com, right? And there's also a link where people can support the show passively, meaning they don't have to do anything. It's brilliant, right? So when you go and say you shop on Amazon, like we all do, if you use the link, amazon.com forward slash shop, and then forward slash cheap geek, we receive a small percentage. And it doesn't cost anybody anything. It's just what Amazon would pay us. And that helps us buy snacks and coffee to power the show. And hopefully an adverb. I don't think we can afford an adverb right now. You know, it also helps us to get the full version of Grammarly. <laughs> so we can do this correctly. Yeah. So there you go. Also, if you have a story or something you'd like to share with us, whether it's anonymously or non-anonymously, you can oh do so. God, this whole episode. <laughs> hey, you can do so. By calling our phone number, 1-575-208-4025. And that is a Roswell area code. Yeah. We're not really in Roswell. We're in Western North Carolina. 
Equally as creepy, come to find out. Yes. So if this is your first time tuning in, this is kind of what we're all about. We like the weird, the wacky, strange, the paranormal. We like all of that stuff. We like ghosts. We like cryptids. Right? We like aliens. We like just the weird, oddball type stuff. We like it all. We don't discriminate. We are equally enthused by most all of it. Anything that And we is, are not a professional on any of it. Yeah. Anything that is, you know, the unusual, unexplained phenomena, the high strangeness. But we do try to take a lighthearted approach while also taking a more technical approach to yeah. it. Yeah. And if you're a group out there that researches this kind of thing and you'd like to give us a call, please, by all means, do. Yeah. Because what we found is in our little adventures doing this podcast, it seems like a lot of these groups, whether they research one thing or the other, just don't communicate. It's weird. It's like that you have to be super famous or something before people really start to communicate, and there's no reason for that to happen. Don't step on any toes. I'm no. not stepping on any toes at all. I'm yeah. just saying that I think people need to communicate better, especially, you know, we're trying to actively get out and communicate. Right. True. And we're trying to find, you know, like minded people to go out there and, you know, research this kind of stuff, especially when you when you find people that know more about this than the average bear. Yeah. That fed a kid for two days in the woods. We're going to tell you about that. Makes no sense. Yeah. So why not? So if you are a group out there, whether you do research in the paranormal or your UFOs or cryptids or anything like that, give us a call. Yeah. We'd like to hear from you, especially if you're local. If you're in Western North Carolina, we're here. Give us a holler. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so there you go. So let's give you an update from our bunker studio. The update is pretty simple. We're in an undisclosed location. We've used things to sound, deaden, and treat and get our podcast hopefully sounding very good. I think we've got that sort of figured out. We bought the mascot an extra chair. Yes. Our paranormal pupper, or paranormal <laughs> pupper, I guess we could say paranormal pupper, our paranormal pepper, the pup. <laughs> this whole episode the little dog. is not brought to you by Grammarly at all. No, it's brought to you by cough drops <laughs> and cold medicine. Take it today, right? <laughs> So, anyway, um, yeah, we have, <laughs> our our dog Pepper has now inherited the super crap chair, which was used to be my computer chair, which from the day I put it together did nothing but creak and moan and complain about carrying the girth of a big man like myself. And if you'd like to hear about that chair, you can go listen to our older <laughs> podcast yeah, episodes. Listen to our last two podcasts when that creak is you know every time you move, and it's just like it's like being in prison, can't move at all in a little box. Because, you know, as soon as you did, the chair would creak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, new chair aside, Pepper now has a throne. And when we start doing our audio slash video podcast and stream live from our new undisclosed location, because we have one coming, we're going to announce that a little later, I suppose, you'll be able to see the paranormal pupper. Yeah. Pepper sitting in a chair. It should be par uh, Pepper the paranormal pupper. I don't think they can print that many letters on a t-shirt. Uh, I think it's... Just triple P or P3. <laughs> right. So anyway, this podcast today is about mysteries of the Appalachian Trail and Sasquatch in the Carolinas and some weird news peppered about. Yes. So like I said, I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And we're going to start the show in just two seconds. That was two seconds. Very nice. Can't help me. Okay, um, if you listen to the podcast in the past, if you listen to the audio version of the podcast and you've been downloaded to follow us, we'd very much appreciate it. You can listen to the podcast on iTunes and SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Google, Google, Google Play. Play Music, anywhere you can find a podcast, you can find our podcast. Mm -hmm. So we do appreciate that. And if you listened in the past before, you do know, or you should know, that we do like to start our podcast with an interesting and random factoid. Yes, but I was going to back up there. We still have three days left on our little contest. Anybody who puts in a nice new rating on iTunes or Google Play or any of the major podcast carriers, send us a note that you reviewed the podcast, gave us a little rating, and you are entered in to get a free sticker from us. So Nice. Yeah, heads up. That contest is about to end, and we'll announce it within the next two podcasts in February. But... Yeah, give us a ranking. Rankings, you know, only the finest quality three to five star reviews. You can't, you is can't what do we, that. What we used to say, but if you have constructive criticism, we do appreciate it. No, we don't. Don't I don't want that stuff on there. Anyways. You should send that to us privately. <laughs> <clears throat> so. so, 
that contest is going still going on. That's what I was going to say. I was going to go somewhere with that, but well, then go somewhere with that. I forgot where ah, I was going. This podcast is brought to you by Cold Medicine. No. Okay. Anyway, getting back to the business at hand, which is the interesting random factoid. Mm-hmm. Tell them what it is, because this is the one that you wrote. And it kind of relates to this podcast. So, yeah, many of the topics we're going to talk about in the, tonight's episode uh, revolve around the Appalachia, specifically the Appalachian Trail. Now, the Appalachian Trail, everybody knows it's that big, giant hiking trail. It's one of the longest ones on the East Coast. But the Appalachian Mountains themselves extend all the way up to Newfoundland. That's the first interesting factoid. A lot of people think they kind of taper off once you hit the Northeast and... That's not necessarily true. They go all the way to Newfoundland. So, Newfoundland? Newfoundland. Why don't you say Newfoundland? I don't know how. That's why. <laughs> it goes all the <laughs> way up to Newfoundland. And also, the 2,200-mile trail is the longest hiking-only trail in the world. Um, and that's because other longer trails, you know, like uh, the Pacific, you know. Crest Trail? Yeah, those trails, they may require some sort of vehicle or assistance crossing major environmental obstacles, things like cliffs, rivers, major waterways, or like I know some of the trails have been cut due to, you know, the border wall stuff. So Isn't that a song by Oasis? No, that's Wonderwall. Border wall. Mm-hmm. And now border wall. <laughs> right. No. Well, that's nice. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Longest, technically the longest trail, and it goes so far. I found out uh, there's an international Appalachia Trail where it, you know, stretches all the way up through Canada. Huh. So yeah. Well, that's also very nice. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. So um, <clears throat> aside from that, we've been talking a little bit about the Appalachian Trail. Give you an idea of the length and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You come across some paranormal encounters on the Appalachian Trail, and these are stories of weirdness that happened on the Appalachian Trail, right? Yeah. We're going to call the Appalachian Trail the AT Trail. Okay. Because it makes us sound cool. And that means it's also less likely that we're going to mispronounce Appalachian Trail. <laughs> right? Yeah. All right, so here we go. All right, so this is from Mysterious Universe. And Which is another podcast. They're not quite as good as we are, but they are getting and making inroads to be good. Actually, they're really great. I like them. <laughs> <You> <laughs> yeah. Right now, you. It's funny. It'd be great if they were like, you can call us out on Twitter. <laughs> hey, Creep Geeks. How dare you? Like, you guys are from Australia. Bring it. We'll take you. It's like Pepper. Attack. <laughs> uh, nah. But no, it's a good podcast. No. Uh, but yeah. Okay. So they're talking about. Some paranormal encounters that actually happened on the Appalachian Trail. And this is from an article that was on January 15, 2019. Yeah. Right? And it does reference some... The one reason I like this is because it's referencing some sources that I've had a hard time looking up. Um, because we, you know, now that we're out here, I want to find out more information about the creepiness of the area we're in. Yeah. Uh, and they pulled some stuff from a uh, report from the site Blue Ridge Outdoors. Which is kind of funny. Yeah. Because if you look at it, the Appalachian Trail, right? Mm-hmm. 2,200 miles long, like you were saying. Goes through 14 states. Yeah. I mean, everywhere from, what, Georgia? All the way to Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So pretty much, you know, with the exception of, I think, Florida, it's the entire East Coast. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. So... It's, you'd figure. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah. And parts of it, like you were saying before, cut through Canada to Newfoundland Mm -hmm. with sections continuing in Greenland. Yeah. Through Europe and into Morocco. I did not know that millions of people walk this trail every year. Yes. It's the most hiked uh, through hike trail in the world. And it goes through some of the most haunted places along the longest trail of the world. Yeah. So. Wow. That's the thing, though. That's crazy. With. A trail so... 14 states, multiple countries. You'd figure with a trail that goes through 14 states just in the United States and is so long and is so extensive, you'd be able to find creepiness. But you have to dig into folklore. You have to dig deep into folklore. Or 
you know, go a different direction like uh, David Polides did with Missing 411. Yeah, Polides. Polides, sorry. Yeah, Polides. He has Missing 411 where he takes it to a different perspective with these missing people and high strangeness with their disappearances. And other than that, there's nothing. So yeah. coming across these reports, which, uh, you know, Mysterious Universe did this research and finding stuff like from Blue Ridge Outdoors is very helpful to keep the conversation going. So, you know, I, I like this article and that's why I wanted to share it with you guys. Now, um, getting back to, you know, this report, this was on Blue Ridge Outdoors. It's told by a witness named Brad Lane. Uh, the odd experience happened in the summer of 2011 when he was out backpacking alone along the trail near Catawba, about 15 miles from a place called Newcastle, Virginia. And he was camping all out, you know, along the way on the trail. <clears throat> now, over the course of these lonely nights, because he was solo hiking, he claims that on several occasions he was outside, you know, he was kept awake by what um, sounded like footsteps crunching or about outside, as well as what he describes as a grumble of a voice talking to itself. He convinced himself that it was all just his ears playing tricks on him, but on another evening, he saw something that would disturb him. And he says, I managed to collect a fair amount of firewood, and by the time nightfall came, I had a small fire going with a good collection of firewood piled beneath me. Under the reassuring light of the campfire, I started to become more at ease with the deafening silence of nature. I pulled a cigarette from my pocket and enjoyed a casual smoke as I put my feet up. Um, when I tried to ditch the butt in my weakened flame, uh, my throw was off and it landed, I guess I landed it outside of the ashes. I got up to fix my mistake and to stoke the fire when I turned around to go back to my seat and I saw him. The light was low with my little fire, but I could clearly see a man reaching down with a scorched hand for my firewood. He wore red plaid with large black burns tearing at his trim and a red ashy beard that smoldered at his face. He quickly looked up and his vacant white eyes connected with mine. He gritted his teeth and scrunched his nose towards me before quickly leaving the ring of firelight. Oh, I was shocked. I had never experienced a fear like that. I fell right onto my butt next to the flames. I looked out into the forest and saw nothing but dark shadows and unclear objects, a blank wall of nothing, of everything. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even yell with no one to hear me but him. So I did what every red-blooded American would do. I packed up my things and I got the hell out of Dodge. Mm. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> now... He kind of, you know, panicked, took off, and just kept hiking. I mean, he hiked until dawn. He was just rushing to get out of that particular wilderness area. He decided to stop for a moment. He had grown tired and just, you know, let's, okay, I'm going to just stop, take a break. Uh, he kind of drifted off to sleep during that break. So three hours later, um, he woke up. The sun had dropped down considerably, and a funny smell filled his nostrils. He blinked a few times, and the funny smell that I smelled shot off my back with my heart beating to the sound of something troubling. What I saw was my tent, or what remained of my tent. For now, the only thing left standing was the tent poles that dripped with oozing leftovers of my tent body. A bubbly layer of melted green plastic lay beneath the poles with a steady gray smoke still rising from the mess. I got up and felt the weight of the sky fall on my head. For a moment, I was sure I had woken up into a horrible nightmare. Without contemplating it much further, I grabbed my water bottle and I ran through the empty pasture. By the time I made it to the gravel road, I was out of breath and dripping with sweat. I hastily chugged my water from my bottle and wiped my mouth. Down the road, I could see a vehicle parked in the dust. I staggered forward with my hands on my sides and soon realized it was a sheriff's sedan. And for the first time in a long time, I couldn't have been happier to see a law enforcement vehicle. When I got closer to the vehicle, I noticed that it was parked outside of the remains of a charred house. Nothing left standing but the mailbox out front. On the way into town, I didn't tell the officer about my experience, being afraid that... 
He might think I escaped from the loony bin and instead asked him about the burnt down house he had parked in front of. The sheriff explained to me that four days prior, the same day I started my trip, the house had burnt down. They had no known cause, but there was an indication of arson. Two daughters, a wife, and her husband were all in the house when the fire started, and none of them made it out. Real tragic stuff, the sheriff said, as he retold the story, and I could only shake my head with my bottom jaw hanging low. So, Mm. yeah, did he see the father from that burnt-down house? Did he see the guy that set the fire? Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. That's kind of creepy. I know. And it's kind of a little disjointed, but... And I, not that my reading of it was... Like, how, how did his tent catch on fire? Yeah, that's the thing. Did the burning guy set his tent on fire? Yeah. So... Hmm. Yeah. And it's... See, and that's the part that kind of threw me, because it sounded like he packed everything up and took off. So did most people... Those tents can get expensive. So I assumed he packed up his tent. Well, yeah, you know? I would think so. So then yeah. he kept on, and then did he make camp but not intend to fall asleep? All it says is he immediately woke up three hours later and his tent has burned down. Yeah. You know, that, what? That kind of missing time, a Mm. ghost. I don't know. I don't know. But you'll hear stories from hikers doing through hikes. Through hikes are emotionally and psychologically draining. They can wear on people. That doesn't mean even the strongest ones don't experience something weird. Mm. So... You'll get encounters from people telling you stories of seeing people who aren't there or seeing things that seem like time bubble type situations. Yeah. And you don't really know how to respond to that. (laughs) I mean, what are they seeing? Do other people see it as well? You know, like not through hikers, not long term hikers. Well, I don't know. I mean, most of these trails go through like or, or close to like neighborhoods or something. Like houses or neighborhoods or um, community type things, so maybe it's like along the outskirts, right? It'd be like along the fringe um, of these communities. So maybe since they're just in that location, hmm. I mean, I'm sure some things happen on parts of the trail where there's like nobody, where you might be like fifty, sixty, hundred miles away from somebody. You know? Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of weird. So I mean, there's other reports too. Like, of course, you're going to have like the you know. Bigfoot mm-hmm. um, and other type things. But, you know, this one was <clears throat> part of a, another report that came from Phantoms and Monsters about the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. Happened in the mid-1980s. And it says, um, when the witness was at a shelter, because they have shelters along the Appalachian Trail and cabins and things like that. Yeah. You know, like little sort of rustic put-together things you can stop along the way and take breaks and things like that. Yeah. Um, this was uh, in Amherst County, Virginia. This, this guy was hiking with his uh, son and their dog named Ginger, right? Yeah. Because yeah, a lot of people <clears throat> will actually camp, or they'll hike and make it to a camp, and they'll stay for a day or two or whatever and keep on going. So this is one of those camps. And so as they were relaxed at their camp and they were talking, they saw something very odd that came shambling out of the, uh, out of the wilderness. Shambling. I don't think I've ever shambled. <laughs> right. Um, but the witness yeah. said of what happened next, the figure came to within 100 feet. It was tall, wore a dark brown fur coat, right? Yeah. And, you know, the person was aware of Ginger's barking, like the owner of Ginger. Yeah. And he basically said, I had never heard that come from her before. Yeah. Like that weird sort of dog bark. And you're like, what? You know? Yeah. Uh, without thinking, I called out to the figure to come over and have some hot drink. And that's when things got very difficult to explain. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so if we're ever out in the woods, just a personal note from me to you. And something, a large brown thing comes shambling out in the woods. The last thing I'm going to do is, hey, man, come on over, friend. <laughs> have some apple cider. <laughs> yeah, have a drink. <laughs> so, yeah, it says, first, the creature turned to us. Its face looked human in shape, but not human in appearance. It turned its whole body. I mean, that's kind of creepy. Because, yeah. you know, the theory is Sasquatch doesn't really have, like, a pronounced, like, neck. So when it turns, it turns like its whole body to look at you. Kind of thing. You ever heard that before? Mm. Yeah, I have. <laughs> I'm just saying, right? Yeah. And it says it turned its whole body. And when a creature looked at us is when Ginger's barking changed. Her hind legs appeared uncontrolled. Oh. Yeah. 
Her sounds were her not barking sounds, but a gurgling noise. Yeah. She was in great pain. I momentarily focused on Ginger reaching down, uh, to which, you know, didn't stop her suffering. So he's like trying to, I guess, rub it off of her, you know, kind of like when you grab your dog. Yeah. Right? I looked at the creature, continued to, basically, it continuing its long athletic strides, which took it out of sight very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then Ginger resumed barking, um, you know, with her aggression, yeah. right, her warning, but not the same as before when it turned to us. My son said, Dad, what happened to Ginger? And mm-hmm. I was thinking, what did that thing do to Ginger when it was 100 feet away? He says, mm-hmm. I, I was not fearful, and Ginger was a handful of golden retriever. We spent a cold night with Ginger at alert the entire time. When we made our way to the warmth of my car the next morning, yeah. uh, Ginger curled up on my son in the back seat and slept for a three-hour dri- three drive home. I've since learned that the area had <clears throat> excuse me, a fall and winter with dogs making a lot of noise at night with a large number of those dogs going missing. Oh, no. Also, a calf got missing, like a baby cow. Yeah. Um, without a trace. The owner was uncommitted as to what was going on, but his grandfather had a story about the brown man. Ew. Yeah. He hadn't seen anything, but the neighbors had. Something dreadful happened at that shelter in 2011. This was August. A hiker was found dead and half buried. And this was supposed to be in 2016 when this took place. Okay. So I haven't heard of an arrest. Yeah. And I'm interested if there are any similar accounts of these things harming dogs. I'm a skeptic looking for an exclamation or an explanation um, for Ginger's actions and other Bigfoot mind, you know, because that's what he talks about, right? Some people think that Bigfoot has some kind of mind control, like over dogs and humans, because like they'll say when they see it, or just, people are frozen or spots, they, they just can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder what that was, right? See, now I'm trying to look that up because I vaguely remember something happening in 2011. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so, oh. See, wow, more than one person died in 2011. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Scott Lilly, a hiker from Indiana, died on the AT on the 12th of August, 2011. Yeah. Yeah, it says he may have died from asphyxia, from suffocation, so he, it was a murder. So, hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow, that's crazy. But that goes back to the whole, like, missing 411. This thing says that there are, let's see. Wow, there's like a list. 11 Appalachian Trail murders Yeah, since 1974. Yep. Ooh, not cool. So. You did not know about this? I didn't know there was 11. I think there's actually a book, something. I think it's called, like, Appalachian Trail Murders, where it talks that. You know, the theory is, is that there was a serial killer through hiker that would make this trip. And, you know, when they were, whenever they did it, people would die. You never heard that before? No. You're all like, I want to hike the occupation trail. I'm like, that thing is dangerous, man. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. There's a bunch of other stories, too. There's um, a story from the website, Your Ghost Stories. Mm-hmm. It says, there's another very paranormal experience from the Appalachian Trail. It supposedly happened in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And the witness at the time was about 10. And they were doing some backcountry camping uh, along the trail with her father and mother. Okay. okay. And they settled down for a night in the clearing. And that's when she be, you know, began to sense something was off about the whole scene. The little girl. Mm-hmm. She said, I looked up to my mother uh, to notice that she was pale and her hand was tightly grasping mine. Right? Yeah. And she said, I guess she's not a girl. I thought she was a little girl. Um, <clears throat> the kid's name was Todd. Is Todd a girl's name? No, she's talking. Her mom is asking her dad. Oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't say that. Todd, can we set up camp someplace different? My mother asked. Ooh, she got the mom vibe. Still clutching my tiny hand. She was not liking the vibe the woods were giving. I sensed it too. I was afraid. My father shook his head and said, It's getting late. I'm not searching for firewood in the dark. I remember asking to go home. The small clearing seemed to give an ominous vibe. After hot dogs and marshmallows, we crawled into the six-person tent my father had purchased. My father fell asleep in mere minutes, but my mother and I could not sleep. Hmm. Emma, are you asleep? I guess her mother asked. I lifted my head. No, Mama, I'm scared. I can't sleep. And she goes, hush, it's fine. We're safe inside the tent. She comforted. 
I finally fell asleep and woke up in the early hours of the morning. I came out of the tent and saw my mother sitting on the ground meditating. She meditated every morning with a cup of tea. I came up to her and tapped her shoulder. Mama, can we, can we take a walk? And mother opened her eyes and got to her feet. Sure, let's not go too far. I don't want daddy to worry. We hiked near our campsite when my mother suddenly stopped. I followed her gaze to see a hazy image of a man leaning against a birch tree about 20 feet away. He was just a hazy image, but he did not seem threatening, just calm and solemn. He lifted his head and looked in our direction. I rubbed my eyes and he was gone. My mother just looked at me and I understood that the man was not threatening, just calm and sad. After that, I have never <clears throat> seen a ghost, but I will never forget him ever. Mm. That's a hazy man. No one knows what it's like to be the hazy man. Would you hush? <laughs> to just, be the sad man. That's just creepy. and The solemn man. Because a lot of the stories aren't, I mean, they're trying to pass this one off as, you know, nothing malicious. <clears throat> but still, I mean, you but see a freaking, you know, yeah. hazy, solemn dude just leaning against a tree. That weird vibe. And my thing is that the the previous story where they're all like, you know, the basically mind control and hurting the dog. I, I don't. Bigfoot. I don't necessarily believe those theories. I, I think of something far more sinister, like not a Bigfoot. What if it's something we're not even not even on our radar? Right well, now? I'm wondering. <clears throat> I've been wondering if, you know, the whole thing with the you know Bigfoot being able to lock you in your in your. I wonder if it's infrasound, man. I keep thinking about infrasound and want to research that. How you can control or cause yeah. re- reactions or actions from this infrasound. You know, the human body can sometimes have no control over that sort of thing. I wonder if it has something to do with it. You know? Like maybe the Bigfoot can utter some infrasound type vocal that cause the dog to lose control of the old back legs. But it was, takes the fire out of it. It was the back legs. It was her nervous system, and it was obviously and she's kind of gurgling. Yeah, her vocal cords. Yeah, like maybe it's like you know using sound to sort of microwave the dog. So, yeah. I mean, who knows? You know, seeing a ghost lean up against a tree is kind of weird. Whatever it was, yeah. there's another account too where a witness said that they've been backpacking along a trail of a group of friends, mm-hmm. right? And then that suddenly they would have an unsettling experience. One morning, he says they woke up to the unsettling sound of children's laughter. And, you know, basically emanating from around the camp. Mm-hmm. And it was odd considering they were out of the out of the middle of nowhere. Yeah. That's what makes it creepy for me, right? They're in the middle of nowhere and there's little kids playing and crying, and like making little kid noises and junk. As they peered into the early morning mist, they say a procession of kids suddenly walked by. That's weird. And it says, uh, <clears throat> you know, they asked what they were doing there and the baffled witnesses answered they were hiking the actual Appalachian Trail. Yeah. To which the mysterious children cheerily, cheerfully replied, this isn't the Appalachian Trail, before wandering off out of sight. And it says, according to them, they could hear the children's laughter taunting them from the trees and underbrush for the duration of their hike, although they never saw the children again. So, I followed somebody, like on Instagram and stuff, on his Appalachian Trail hike, and he had a similar experience. Where- Ooh. Where he heard the laughter, right? He didn't see the kids. Yeah. But it creeped him out so bad. And he was with other people on that section of the AT. Mm. They were all so creeped out. They went into town and told their story. And the town's just like, yep, just keep on going. Yep. And (laughs) that messed them up. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, they're just like, yep. So, and where where would there be a gaggle? Because, like, getting to town took them a whole day and a half to mm. get to town. So there's no gaggle of children out there. Weird, it would make man. no sense. So Maybe ghost or something. And then the this isn't the Appalachian Trail to me, I think that's like a uh, what do you call those? The time You mean like little people? No, no. I uh, it's one of your theories for uh why we see petrosaurs. Oh, like the time bubble thing. Yeah, yeah. Like displaced time, or yeah, going through like a portal or something. You know, some sort of a gateway, yeah, if you will, to either a different time or a different dimension or parallel universe, even parallel Earth. What if it's like a group of school children? Yeah, maybe they were on their way to school and they walked through the bubble. Yeah. You know, to them, they're still cruising through their 
wherever they're gone and, and they happen to see yeah. these people. And, then. and they're absolutely right because, yes, that section of the AT wasn't the AT. It was probably something that was outside of town or a little yeah. further away. I mean, to the kids, yeah. they're yeah. like, they're, they're near where they are, right? They're yeah. on their way to school or whatever. Yeah. And they see them. And maybe that's why they couldn't see them. Like, and they, you know, hear them like laughing and poking at them from you know, the trees and the underbrush because it's just sort of carrying over from whatever portal that is. Yeah. I mean, that would all make sense, really. If you think about it, that wouldn't, that would explain or could explain most everything. <laughs> time when slips. You, yeah. When you see weird shit like that, it's yeah. like, you know, if a time slip happens and a pterodactyl flies through and he's just doing this thing and, you know, pops back through into his time and you've seen it, you're like, what the heck? No sight. Mm-hmm. I mean, other than what you see, there's like no sign of them, no leftovers, you know, no real evidence. And like with Sasquatch and stuff, you get the occasional footprint and hair and things like that, but really no real evidence. Yeah. I mean, there's video and stuff like that, but every, it seems like every video I see, it, it's like, you, you just, you can't, you can't say it's real. Right. Mm hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even call most of it evidence because it's just the video. It's like, unless you're actually there and can see it, you know, because everything you see, it's just the video is freaking terrible. Right? <laughs> it's like, it's not clear enough. It's too far away. It's too dark. It's too obscured by trees. And there was a couple of videos I seen where, you know, like one of them was like the, supposed to be the face of, of Bigfoot, right? Yeah. Done by um, Todd. What's that guy's name? Mm. I can't remember. He, he's like from Canada and he's up there and he's talking about, he put apples out for the Bigfoots and stuff like that. Todd Standing, I think is what his name is. Mm-hmm. And there's one that shows like, it looks kind of like, it, funny, it reminds me of an Ewok face. Oh, you know? okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen that one. And you see it clear as day, or you you know, it's it's been to where you you can see it clear. And it's like, I can't tell if that's real or not, you know? And that's what I don't like about this whole thing when it comes to some of this stuff. It's like, I see it. If, I mean, if, if it's a fake, it looks pretty good. But to me, it looks like a freaking Ewok. Mm-hmm. So I was like, but you know, who am I to say what a Bigfoot's supposed to look like? You yeah. know what I mean? If there actually is a Bigfoot out there, a primate or whatever it is, you know, a North American great ape kind of thing, maybe that's what they look like. And see, I'm. Which is sad because then I'll be like, everybody's like, ah, oh, it's fake. You <laughs> know, maybe it's really <laughs> yeah. real, right? But, and see, that's a problem. Like, <clears throat> as critical as I am a lot of times on this podcast of like any photographic evidence. I'm also, especially out here, we're in a different environment out here in North Carolina where it's not always bright and sunny, where, you know, visibility is not that great. And I'm just trying to take not spooky, not crypto pictures. I'm just trying to take pictures of the lake or, you know, the creek. Yeah. It seems like, especially in the wintertime, any picture you take out here looks ominous. Yeah. Hmm. Like we... We have a small horse in the neighborhood, and it's taken me. It's not growing up yet. It's a little, it's a little baby horse. It's like a little. It's a miniature pony. Yeah. And its name is Mister Sheffield. What? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to take pictures of him, and he's not, you know, all black or all dark brown fur or a dark color fur like Bigfoot or Sasquatch. He is a tan. He's like tan and white, right? Yeah, tan and white, white cream, long hair pony. Yeah. And I can't get a decent photo of him from. You know, ten yards. And you know what the problem is with most of these photos? Mm-hmm. Is that the thing you're taking a picture of has fur? Yeah. Or hair, and it's always hard to take a picture of something that has fur. Or texture. Hair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that particular texture that makes it hard. It like velour up. is really hard to take a picture of. It always looks kind of like soft, even yeah. if it's sharp. You know. It messes up the contrast. It messes up the depth of the photo. It messes up the focusing system in the camera because it can't really lock on. Yeah. You know, whether it's using phase detection or contrast detection, autofocus, it just makes it really hard to see. Yeah. So. So. Especially with the, with the cameras we have these days. The contrast and, and basically digital imagery that comes out of these cameras is really sharp. You know, if this was like 40 years ago and you took that picture, people would think it was amazing because of film. You know, film makes things look soft and film-like. Yeah. We've now since switched how we view images into, oh, it's really sharp and contrasty. It's digital. I love it. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you see one that's like film, you're like, hmm, I don't like it. It's not as sharp as it could be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Creepy. (laughs) There's a bunch of these stories from Appalachian Trail, and they span all the way up through, you know? Yeah. 
Um, like there was a place called Sarver Canyon or Car. I'm sorry, Sarver. I can't even say it. Sarver Cabin in Virginia, right? Yeah. Built in the 1850s, well off the beaten path of the long trail, surrounded by feral wilderness, and the crumpled ruins of the place is supposed to be haunted by a ghost called George, who is unidentified. Well, then how do they know he's called George then if he's unidentified? Okay. But he makes his presence known to all who pass through. And it says another old batch of haunted, crumbling ruins is an old, home, home, old homestead known, or I'm sorry, located in the Big Ridge State Park in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And this is a place where it was once the home of the Hutchinson family in the 19th century when one of the family's younger members, a girl named Mary, she'd fallen ill. Yeah. And when the neighbors came over to help, they reported hearing a dog running through the forest towards them, although they couldn't see it. Yeah. And it would soon become apparent that the girl had passed away at precisely the time they heard the spectral beast. Oh. Yeah. And to this day, that area is supposedly haunted by a phantom hound and the ghost of a little girl. That's creepy. Yeah. And then there was one story we didn't really go into at all, but it mentions a um, a dark figure with an oversized hat and this long coat that you can't see because either there's a fog rolling in or the weather's changing, so the visibility is bad. And um, this one particular hiker was hiking in moonlight when this happened, and he couldn't make the guy out, and the figure just fades away. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of those. Yeah. So, but it's it's weird because it's this typical, like, um, how do you put it? Uh, trying to find the description. It's like, a, it's like a that sort of apparition yeah. that you see, and then when you try to get the discernible details, a, it just fades away. A wide brim brown, dark yeah. brown or black hat, and then a heavy, heavy coat. And it seems to be confused or standoffish, but then it just disappears or fades away. So mm. if you do get close to it, reports of icy blue eyes that fill you with dread and then disappearing. Creepy. Yeah. And there's a couple of reports of that through not just this article, but when you do start digging into this. My thing is, though, everything we've talked about so far, it's like a range of stuff. Maybe we should find one or two and like kind of dig into them, you know. You mean right now? <laughs> Not now, but okay, yeah. Because I was, was going to say no. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there is a bunch of them. I mean, there's yeah. even like uh, in places like Compton's and Fox's Gap, as well as Spook Hill, mm-hmm. where they had fierce battles that raged in 1862 during the American Civil War. And at the time, this place it was like you know, it's a war, it's a battlefield, right? Yeah. Bad things, full of like blood and carnage and dead bodies. Many of those dead bodies don't receive proper burial. And they say that in some of those areas, there's been intense paranormal activity ever since. And one of the most popular legends is about cars that are being, that are basically parked at Spook Hill mm-hmm. will be pushed up the incline by unseen hands and that the ghostly handprints will appear on the vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. But we've heard that about that place in I, we've Texas. We've heard that in like 10 or 15 different places. Every It seems like every place that has any kind of paranormal activity yeah. or reported or local sort of paranormal activity, like local lore has one of those where something will push you out of the way or whatever. Yeah. But the problem is, is that there's also numerous apparitions of Civil War era soldiers that are there. Hmm. And that's at like Spook Central. Right? Yeah. Which is Spook Hill. Hmm. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Absolutely so, named. Yeah. I mean, so. there's the trails are so long. I go through so many different states and places, even other countries. It, it would make sense. There's a, you know, just by having that much mileage to go through, 2,000 miles, 20, was 2,200 miles, whatever it is. I mean, I could see a lot of weird stuff. In our last podcast, we talked about the like the, the white creatures. Some of those were happening in and around the Appalachian Trail where Kentucky is. Yeah, well, we're going to get into that later. So, <laughs> the white beast or whatever it was. I can't remember. We yeah. did talk about that, right? It yeah, it was the West again. Virginia. Yeah. Um, the white hounds. And yeah. The white, yeah, the white creatures. So, And they're always like a disheveled dirty white gray color yeah. no matter what it is whether it was like a like if you get like a white pomeranian you give it a bath and like two seconds later <laughs> dirty because they're long hairs uh, no these would th- be things like dire wolves or two-headed dogs or dogmen creatures ah. so well it sounds like this is a perfect time for us to take a break you're listening to creepy Geeks podcast we're going to take a second and we'll be right back we're going to talk about that missing north carolina boy oh who was taken care of by a bear yes well, that's what he says, and he ate some bear food. He was missing for two days. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Audible is an audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, the listeners of the Creep Geeks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. So this vanished boy yeah. spent two days, right, mm-hmm. being lost from his grandmother's yard in North Carolina. He's been found alive, and the little kid, the little boy, says he spent two days with a bear. Yeah, and yeah. what is consistent through all the articles that are all over the Internet right now is that the original FBI investigation states that during the time he was missing, they feel he was moved across multiple locations and different areas during the time he was missing. Yes. Yeah. But the fact that he was found a short distance from his house, kind of tangled up in some briars near a bucket. Yeah. It doesn't uh, make sense. That, and he was found by somebody walking her dog. I guess she was doing a little, little country hike. We call them country walks, but it's like a hike... Or you end up on the road, or you end up in, you know, a field, you know? Yeah. And this woman with her dog found him tangled in some briars next to a bucket. That doesn't make sense, because they had been through the area. Yeah, they had already combed that particular area, which goes right back to missing 411. Yeah. The person is found in, or within an area that was... It's been searched multiple, multiple, multiple times, you know? Yeah, so... 
that the problem with what is being said in the news, unless you start adding the <clears> word <throat> Sasquatch or Bigfoot, is there are no other details you would normally get from a missing or found person's news article. Yeah. Like, you know, um, original reports were they were f- afraid somehow he had been taken by somebody. And, yeah. you know, um, and there were leads. Well, that's not even being mentioned now. It, it is mentioned that they do think mm. he was moved several times while he was missing. Yeah. So, but it, it, the reports from the kid who is now recovering in the hospital, he's just fine. Um, he's eating nuggets and Cheetos and watching Paw Patrol. And he's been telling people huh. that a bear took care of him for two days. Yeah. I hung out with a bear and the bear gave me bear food. That's kind of crazy. What bear gives a kid food? Yeah, and what's bear food? Yeah, exactly. Don't they eat like most everything, like grubs and bugs and, and trash, and trash, <laughs> and garbage pizza. Yeah. So, what if <clears throat> supposing the Sasquatch is a real deal, mm-hmm. and there'd be male and female Sasquatches, right? Yeah. What if it was like a lady Sasquatch, seen him out there hanging around and decided to take him for a while? That would make some sense. And then, you know, went back to the other Sasquatch, and they're like, what are you doing? You can't have that. That belongs to somebody. <laughs> right? It doesn't have enough hair. Put it like, back. Like, what is that? No, you can't, no, you can't keep that. And I mean, serious. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, she has, uh, has to take it back. Yeah. And, then, you know, because, I mean, it, that would make sense, I guess, if you were a Sasquatch. I mean, it would also make sense if you're a person. Take the kid. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, moved around a couple of different times or, or areas, places, that kind of thing. And then eventually kind of return it. Yeah. I mean, who knows, right? But the bear exclama- explanation. Uh, I mean, a, a kid, I would think, would be able to recognize a bear over a person. Yes. But <clears throat> a kid would not be able to recognize a bear over a Sasquatch if it's not in his family's interests or yeah. repertoire, you know? And there's so, also people saying they have such a traumatic experience that the kid probably just imagined the whole thing as a coping mechanism for being stuck out in the woods. But this kid was relatively healthy. Yeah, that's the thing. Happy, yeah. healthy, and from what we've seen, no injuries. No injuries, unharmed. Those are like, those keep getting used in the descriptions and all the articles. Um, supposedly, he played with the bear. The bear kept him company. The bear gave him food. Um, my thing is to just kind of dispel or negate this bear thing. I'm not negating what he's saying. I'm just saying if a bear took him under its wing or whatever, you know, took care of him, he would have some injuries and those would be noted. Yeah. Bears have claws. Yeah. You know, they're going to scratch you. You're going to get something. And even if some highly intelligent bear was like, oh, this is a little creature. I should take care of it. It would have tried to pick him up by the neck. You know, yeah. like a little bear cub or something. So he'd have some scratches, is what I'm saying. So, mm. yeah. And now we have all these people who have hopped on and posted, you know, their theories about Sasquatch and stuff like that. Uh, most of them are YouTube videos. Yeah. You say that. <laughs> so I can't really play them right now. Um, Originally, this kid had been playing in the backyard of his great-grandmother's home with two other children. After some time, the two playmates, they went inside the house, at which point his great-grandmother noticed he wasn't with them. She searched the whole yard. He was gone. Yeah. So she called friends and family over. They spent 45 minutes searching the yard and everywhere else for him, called 911. As soon as 911 happened, uh, according to this, local law enforcement uh, local rescue research, you know, v- rescue volunteers, FBI and NCIS, and some volunteers of the Marine Corps. Why? That's a lot of kid. That's a lot of. I mean, why NCS and Marine Corps? Yeah, NCIS. Yeah, and yeah, why? Those are federal. Those are typically if it's if it's government related, like military. Yeah. Then they're involved. Is it someone like a parent in the military or National that's Guard or not something? being indicated? That's. Another huh. thing. So this article. Unless and, maybe they got called somehow, but it, normally they wouldn't get involved like that. Yeah. And this is from spacedoutradio.com. Mm. So they're saying it's Craven County, North Carolina. But see, there's been other instances like that too, because this is so much like a missing 401 case. Yeah. Well, like David Pilates and all that stuff. 
mm-hmm. <clears throat> where they'll they'll be a missing kid or somebody, a missing person. Yeah. And there'll be people out there looking for them, and all of a sudden the military shows up or something from the military, somebody from the military shows up. They do their own type searches or try to help and then disappear when it's all done. Yeah. Like nobody calls them. They just show up. So how do they know this? And that's where I'm kind of eh, on this particular article. Cause it's kind of weird. And, and some of the, there was a couple of different things that I read from people in comments that said, mm-hmm. um, I live in, in an hour and a half away from there where this child was lost. Let me tell you, we had torrential rain and I mean buckets of rain all night long. Yeah. It was freezing. I'm 51 years old, and I would have died of hypothermia. That child had to have some help out there, and I, for one, believe him. Yeah. And there's another guy that posted to that person's comment. It says, I grew up in the area. I still have lots of friends and family there. I follow the news and weather back home. I know this area very well. It's swampy and deep woods. The only way that child survived was help from something. Yeah. I believe it, and I totally agree with you about the help part. And see, that is... And then somebody's saying... The boy was with his dog, but that was a different story. That wasn't the same one. That was one from like last time. Yeah, that was from a couple months ago. Yeah. And that, yeah, there was some <clears throat> big footedness about that too. But yeah. this is a whole different story. Just happened literally, what, two days ago? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this kid just got found. And people are saying. And you got some people saying, it's winter. Bears are should be hibernating. So who do you hang out with? Yeah. Now, here's the missing 411 part and of it. And somebody else is like, Bear don't, bears don't hibernate here because it's not that cold. Yeah. So. Nobody really knows, man. Yeah. And here's a report saying somebody else, a tip led the search team to a spot where they were able to hear the three-year-old calling out for his mother. They followed his call 40 to 50 yards into the woods through water to find him tangled in vines and thorns. He was cold, alive, and responsive. Hmm expected to be released Friday or Saturday. Hmm. So, yeah. I don't... And, oh, okay, so this is a legitimate article. I mean, this is from KTLA.com. That's that's a major news source. They're saying the same thing. FBI, NCIS, dozens of volunteers, and the Marine Corps were sent out. Hmm. So, and K-9 units. Oh, they decided to employ drones for the search. Finally. 40 to 50 yards into the woods. Hmm. I'm pretty sure you got NCIS, FBI, and Marine Corps out there. They would have found him 40 to 50 yards into the woods. Yeah, it's 150 feet. It's like a football field. <sighs> at the most. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Boy is described as 25 pounds and 2 feet 4 inches tall. So, yeah, certain volunteers were turned away from the search. Yeah. Because of the conditions out. And, you know, we we live away from this area, undisclosed location in North Carolina, but all of North Carolina has been crappy the past week as far as weather. Yeah. And in some of the comments, you know, they're talking about, you know, the the arguing between bear versus Sasquatch. And then you got somebody that pops in there and is like, hi, I am from North Carolina. I have a Facebook page. I'm a real Sasquatch hunter. And it's like, okay, there we go. Yeah. I need to capitalize on this. Like this person left a nice long comment mm-hmm. and then underneath their comment left another comment just saying what their name of their page is called. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Yeah. You know? But here's the thing. And I get it, but. The, the end of this article, which is from KTLA, Hughes, which is one of the FBI people, or, yeah. you know, or one of the search people, says there are no signs of abduction in this case, which is mm. funny because this started off everybody's worst fear that it might have been, you know. Yeah. So, but he's fine. Well, I mean, that's how they start out everything like that, when it's just a a weird sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when they don't find, like, struggle or any real evidence as to where the person went or anything like that, they always say abduction. Well, kids, it's usually the first go-to anyway is abduction. Yeah. Especially if they don't find, like, any evidence, you know. So. So, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where Craven County, North Carolina is. I wonder if it's on the coast of North Carolina. Hmm. I don't know. No. It, where is well, it at? It's. Yeah, it is. It, oh, that throws something in. Where's it, it at? Because you don't really hear about Sasquatch along the coast. Croatoan National Forest. Really? 
Croton, huh? Yeah. Hmm. And they have it spelled the old way on the map. What, Croton? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Croton. So, New Bern, Croton, Cedar Islands, Kingston. So, in between the archaeological find for the lost colony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Mm. That's... Okay, yeah. so it's actually down towards... Uh, yeah. Almost closer towards Southampton County. Yeah. In Virginia. That's kind of along the coast. So, that does explain the Marine Corps, though, because there is a well, station right there. Well, there's so, a... Yeah, well, it, it's yeah. still... You're close enough to military type stuff. Yeah. For sure. This is kind of weird. Yeah. But, I don't know. And I mean, I guess that explains it, because if you're a military base, and you're going to have people that, especially like reservists and everything else that's down that way, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, they could act, they could call on them anytime they want anyway. A lot of them just don't. A lot of local enfor- law enforcement don't, but... Yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I would think that you probably have local law enforcement that are also in the military, whether reserves or some capacity, National Guard or something like that, so that would make sense. Yeah. To basically say, hey, we need some help, and yeah. not, not saying the federal them. government doesn't. Well, if they, it's you got Marines. Marines yeah. are a Department of the Navy, or in part of the Navy in the Department of the Navy. So, NCIS would help. Okay, you know, yeah, if they're asked that kind of thing, because they don't normally necessarily. Then again, who knows? Maybe it's one of those smaller places where it's like we we got a missing child, and so it's like, all right, all hands on deck, let's go. And you throw a rock, you just happen to hit a marine or an NCIS yeah. or an FBI. Because agent, I mean, most you know, <laughs> most military, if they even know, yeah. are going to help. Yeah, but now, there are some cases where there's no military presence, like in the locale, and they'll show up out of nowhere, like flying in with helicopters and stuff. It's like, how do you, how you know, what I mean. How do you That'd get be, word so quickly? Yeah, you if know? they're so close to New Bern and everybody, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. That's yeah. cool. So, okay, so let's, we just dispelled one thing, but. <laughs> well, I mean, it, yeah. yeah, but it's still, there's not enough detail and there probably won't be, you That's know? A, yeah. Because when the parents were talked to about this sort of thing and they, they, they talked about the youngster and the little kid gave us, they, they did not, they, they just kind of like steered clear of that whole bear thing. Yeah. And everybody's like, yeah. God sent him a friend to keep him company. So. God sent Sasquatch. <laughs> Save him. But I mean, what if it, if if it is Sasquatch? If it Jesus, was Sasquatch down there, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it would just lend itself more towards these things can be more human than what we think, I guess. Yeah. If if they're even if they even exist at all, but but I don't know. I mean, this is like a modern day tar. It could have been a modern modern day Tarzan, where you know befriended by the apes. Mm-hmm. So what if Tarzan was really a story about that? Like yeah. a story that was. Like read in the newspaper, and so I will turn it into a book called Tarzan. I don't know. You know what I mean? Because he got lost, his plane crash or whatever it was, and his parents died. And he was raised by apes. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Let's see. That's just crazy. Because the Mowgli action here, raised by a bear. So when he got found, uh, the police were actually just further down the road. You know, um, yeah. continuing their search. And the woman was walking her dog, which normally when stuff like this happens, you're not supposed to go outside unless you're a part of the volunteer team. She was just walking her dog. She kept hearing crying from a certain section on the road. Yeah. So she put her dogs inside and then went to the police and said, hey, I hear her crying. Mm. Yeah. So 40 to 50 yards into the woods, calling for his mom. There's been other stories, too, when kids get lost, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, like the kid would be found and the, the kid will say they had like an imaginary friend. You know, yeah. Or they had a friend that took care of them. So, I mean, he was to say maybe, who knows, maybe the kid did make up a friend. Maybe the kid need, seen a bear. Yeah. Like out there or seen something like a bear and then his mind basically said, that bear's your friend. Hmm. And I would think. To, so he could deal with the situation he's in. Maybe he followed the bear. You and know? that's why he moved around. Yeah. Maybe he's his... just kind of following around. Maybe the bear's just ignoring him. <laughs> you know? Because it's going to be a black bear. It's not going to be a grizzly bear or anything like that. It's North Carolina. It's a black bear. Yeah. So maybe the bear, who's just basically doing its own thing, is like finding food, doing whatever. You know, I think there's so much interaction with black bear. There's a lot of black bear. Yeah. I think there's just so much interaction with humans and black bear that the bear is like, okay, I'm going to do my own thing because you are not a threat to me because you're just a little kid. But. And just kind of what was doing its thing. It would stop a while. And, you know, maybe the kids following it, you know. It is coastal. And about 15 years ago, 
they discovered that red bears are back in seashore or first landing. Yeah, but I mean, red bears is the variation of a black bear. Yeah, but they're smaller. They're, yeah, and they're, but they're less, not. They're less aggressive. Yeah. So, I mean, relatively less aggressive. So, um, yeah, because well, maybe the bears just like, hey man, you keep your distance. I don't care what you do. <laughs> Because a lot of bear are like that. They yeah. usually are in it for themselves. And people say you can scare a bear off, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And maybe this kid wasn't a threat. And maybe the kid just followed the bear around for a while. And maybe the, since the bear has its own little territory, maybe it's circling back because it knew that the Johnson family ate Domino's. <laughs> you know, on Wednesdays, <laughs> yeah. so this trash hand is going to be good for some pizza bones. <laughs> and the kid followed him back, got all tangled up. Pizza bones? And Yeah, that's the crust. <laughs> yeah. Just It's a factoid for you from the Creep Geeks podcast. If you want to know what pizza bones are, eat your pizza down to the crust. Don't eat the crust. Let them harden in the box, and you can give them to your dog. Pizza bone. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. So when you rattle the box, that's the bones inside? That's right. Oh, gosh. Pizza bones. Terrible. Delicious. No. Yes. I don't know. I thought it was pretty interesting because it's... You know, it's good that the little kid got found. That's always great because whenever I hear about missing kids and that sort of thing, I, I instantly think of missing 411. Yeah. And then you see like a little, the little boy that was, I didn't even know the kid was missing. And yeah. then the kid became unmissing. And then it became, the kid was like hanging out with a bear. He said, my bear friend helped me. I ate bear food. And I'm like, what? That's got to be Sasquatch. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I wish it was a bear. That'd be kind of cool. Because then the bear, you know, like, oh, and bears aren't necessarily bad guys anyway. I mean, they can be, but it, it was sort of, I don't know. You know, it kind of, you're like, oh, that's a nice bear. That bear helped him. And there's other stories like that where crazy wild animals you think would just immediately eat this kid, protect them, right? Yeah. Like there was a, some, a, a little girl, I don't know if it's in Africa or India or somewhere like that, and got lost or whatever. And this, like, a bunch of lions protected her from something else. Like she kind of like let her hang out for a while, you know, hmm. and we've seen things with animals like lions and other, like finding other animal babies and kind of taking care of them for a while. Yeah. You know, like the one I think I remember seeing that kind of got me a little bit was, uh, it was like a pride of lions or a lady lion who was kind of doing her own thing. in this little baby chimpanzee, yeah. And she had him for a little while. I was kind of taking care of him because the other lion was going to eat him. Yeah. And she like fended him off and all that stuff and took care of him for a minute. And then when it was safe, she kind of like made him leave, you know, like, okay, now it's safe. You got to go. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was kind of weird. Oh, so that was. Maybe, maybe it wasn't chimpanzee. It might've been a, a um, like a little, like a, like a baboon monkey, you know, it was some kind of little monkey though. So the lion protecting girl, a 12 year old girl was rescued by three lions who was kidnapped by men. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, men forcing her into marriage in yeah. Ethiopia. Yeah. Yeah. They <laughs> chased off her abductors and protected her until she was rescued by Ethiopian police. The men had held yeah. the girl for a week in the remote southwest, um, beating her, mistreating her, stuff like that, before the lions chased them away. That's pretty... That's nutty. That's amazing. So, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And then they guarded her till the cops came. And they're like, oh, cops here. <laughs> the fuzz. <laughs> Take yeah. off. You got to go, Becky. <laughs> Nuts, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of cool with the whole Bigfoot and little kid thing. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Good ending for that. Now the parents got to deal with everybody in the world going, what did he really say? What did the kid actually say? Yeah. You know. And you know there's going to be details about this case that have not been released. Like maybe the kid's guy's clothes on backwards or something that's going to tie it to four only. Because we're not saying anything. We're just saying no injuries, wasn't hurt, he's healthy, he's happy, he's eating Cheetos. End of story. Actually, to address that, the KTLA article that um, I need to put into the show notes for everyone yeah. does mention he was found in the clothes he was wearing. Okay. So. Nothing it, weird with that? Yeah. Hmm. So, but they just leave it at that. And I've noticed certain news agencies since missing 411 has gotten so popular are making the effort to give that information out. Well, that's good. They should be doing that sort of thing. Because, yeah. I mean, honestly, the fact that so many people go m missing in general, and a lot of them are in national parks or a large majority of them, mm -hmm. and the fact that you never really hear about exactly how many, 
because the National Park Service doesn't keep those numbers, which is like absolutely bullshit. Yeah. I mean, come and think about it. The National Park System has to account for their budget, right? Yeah. So you think they wouldn't keep a, a track of the people that go missing in the parts and the manpower that gets sort of brought out to that and how many times they have to activate their little rescue crews and, and volunteers and stuff? Because all that leads towards more additional training, yeah. right? Which is a budgetary expense. I mean, they know how many rolls of toilet paper they use or that's been stolen, but they can't say how many missing people have gone missing in those parks. And I know I don't believe that. I don't believe it because, and I realized there was a good example right in front of me this whole time to say that's a load of crock. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, and it, well, it's true because, okay, so in the Northeast, there's a mountain range, the White Mountains. And every time something like an injury or a missing person happens up there and they have to deploy them, unless you have something called a hike safe card for that mountain range, you are going to be billed for at least part of the amount it took to rescue you. Yeah. So because that's billed to the park service, it's billed to the, you know, the helicopter company that has to fly out. Helicopter fuel costs money. Rescuers cost money. Well-trained people to tackle those mountains cost money. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure that with a lot of these rescues and bills and all the stuff they put out there, it's probably just to cover the some of the, like, minor expenses, right? But still, there's Unless you do something really stupid. Like, the people that do stuff and they're deliberately dumb about it. Yeah. I'm sure they get billed the full on. Like, here's all the bill. Yeah. Well, yeah. and you know, in the hiking groups I'm in, we make jokes about that. We make light of it, even though it is a situ, you know, serious situation. But the point is, there's a paper trail. Yeah. And there's documentation that gets recorded, not just with the the organization that has to perform the rescue or the body recovery, but that gets submitted someplace. Yeah. So there's no way you can tell me, you know, if X person disappears. And, you know, an even bigger or more popular national park, wilderness, whatever, public land, there's no accounting for it. Yeah. It it makes me mad. (laughs) Very nice. Yeah. All right. So we got one last thing to talk about on the Creep Geeks podcast. It's a new feature we're calling the Creature Feature. I know. Where we feature a new, not often heard about creature. Whether it's a cryptid, a paranormal phenomenon around it, or a creature, we're going to call it the Creature Feature. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. And I think it's a neat name. I don't think it's at all cheesy. <laughs> I think it's cheesy. But I do not. Yeah. But the thing is, you know, everybody talks about or finds a niche with a particular cryptid or unexplained phenomena, you know, strangeness. Why not just pick ones that you don't hear about? Yeah, maybe some of the lesser heard about sort of things. And this one kind of creeped me out because... It reminds me of things that I am familiar with, other paranormal or unexplained things I am familiar with. And this is called the Moon-Eyed People. Yes. Now, the Moon-Eyed People are a race of people from the Cherokee tradition who are have said to live in Appalachia until the Cherokee expelled them. Expelled? It, yeah. Huh. And expelled... Not just in the resources in the show notes, but in other places, expelled is a very loose term. Yeah. Um, because there's different stories as to how they left. Um, they are mentioned in a 1797 book by Benjamin Smith Barton, who explains they are called moon eyed people because they saw poorly during the day. Later variants added additional details, claiming the people had white skin, pearly white skin, luminous skin, that they are. That they were, I'm sorry, that they created the area's pre-Columbian ruins and that they were what they went west after their defeat. Barton cited as a source a conversation with Colonel Leonard Marbury. 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 And that person is an early settler of Georgia. Uh, He was a Revolutionary War officer and a congressman in the Second Provincial Congress of Georgia, 1775, and acted as an intermediary between Native American Indians in the state of Georgia and the United States government. Now, in a book, 1902 Myths of the Cherokee, ethnographer James Mooney described a dim but persistent tradition of an ancient people who preceded the Cherokee in Lower Appalachia and were driven out by them. Accounts of them 
having white skin and credit them with building the ancient structures in the area. So anytime settlers would come across something that wasn't, you know, the typical wood, wooden slat or, you know, stuff like that, or a tent or a teepee, things like that, it was accredited to these moon-eyed people. Yeah. And the earliest recorded mention of them appears to be the 1797 book. Um, the Cherokee tell us that when they first arrived in the country which they inhabit, they found it possessed by certain moon-eyed people who could not see in the daytime. These wretches they expelled. Hmm. Now, different accounts are there were battles. Why do they call them wretches? Yeah. There were battles or they drove them underground, things like that. Yeah. Um, Barton suggests that these moon-eyed people were the ancestors of the albinos Lionel Wafer had encountered among the Kuna people of Panama, who were also called moon-eyed people because they could see better at night than they could at day. Um, these moon-eyed people stories are, uh, have several similar accounts. John Hayward wrote in an 1823 book, The Natural and Aboriginal History of Tennessee, of white people who were extirpolated <laughs> in part, and in part were driven from Kentucky and probably also west from Tennessee, attributing the, to this Indian tradition. Um, and then they kept referencing Cherokee encountered these white people along the Little Tennessee River, fortifications left there by the French, um, surrounded by hose, axes, guns, and other metallic utensils. But, you know, these these structures and the things that Cherokee would find, there weren't any Aboriginal peoples or other peoples there when they'd come across these structures. Hmm. Yeah. So it was almost like when the Cherokee did find civilization from these moon-eyed people, they were already long gone. So any encounters there were, were them driving them out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and apparently there's quite a few historical references to these guys, and I've never heard of them. Um, the closest link I could find to them was a place called Fort Mountain State Park, and that's in Chatsworth, Georgia. Yeah. And I, I guess in the state park, I didn't get, I didn't have enough time to get fully into it, but there are these stone wall ruins that aren't attributed to any American settlers, not attributed to like French trying to settle the territory for like trapping or whatever. And the Cherokees say, those ain't ours. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that kind of, it, I don't know. And see, that's what they're talking about when they talk about that wall. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they say, <clears throat> some believe that the Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto built a wall. And this is like a high on top of the Fort Mountain, um, a, what do you call it? Fort Mountain, the, the whole yeah. ancient wall zigzags. It's like 855 feet in length. Hmm. And they thought that it was built to keep the Cherokee out for protection, right? Because, yeah, I guess De Soto, didn't he land in Florida and make his way up or something? Yeah, he was a Spanish conquistador, and he was all about the gold. Yeah. You know? Um, <clears throat> and so with the mountain supply of gold and silver, it made a logical place for him to be. Yeah. But there's many people that say he, didn't, he actually never made it that far wall uh, north, and he never created the wall. Yeah, because it wouldn't make sense to go inland. Yeah, and and up like that. But Yeah. So the, there's another theory is, is that, you know, the wall is the work of Maddock, who's a legendary Welsh explorer, mm -hmm. and other people claim that the moon-eyed people from the Cherokee mythology were the wall's architects. Hmm. That's kind of weird. Yeah. If you if you want to go there, that state park has a parking fee of $5. Yeah. So you can actually go see it. But. So it's that's reasonable. Yeah. And I mean, also if we're ever in that area, we're going to go look at it. I mean, it's it's a... The wall, you see, when you see it, it doesn't look like necessarily like this big giant wall. It's more like a rock boundary type thing, but... But there's a fire tower just north of the wall that yeah. you can climb up and probably get a really good view. Yep, see everything. So, yeah. See, I wish I could find, like, actual physical descriptions of the Moon-Eyed people. Like, how tall are they? And see, that's where it gets to be, like, a little... You know? Yeah. Because you know what this sounds like, right? Yeah. This actually sounds like the goblins of Kentucky and that sort of thing. Because the entire mountain range, right, that we were talking about yeah. earlier, you know, it's all tunnel systems, and it sort of con connects, like... Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, all of that stuff. And the reason and I, the Cherokee lived in all those areas, they still yeah. do. 
And the reason I make that leap, you know, to believing that more towards the goblins thing is because the Cherokee wouldn't always describe other tribes they encountered encountered as wretches. If there were other peoples or other They wouldn't tribes, necessarily like kick them out like that either, you know. Yeah, they would describe them as oh, these people are warriors, oh, these people are mean, oh, these are, but they would describe them as people. Yeah. It would take a lot of translation and emphasis from the Cherokee person to the person who understood them, the English settler, yeah. to make it clear these things are wretches. And, and, you know, maybe they are albinos. Maybe they're albinos that lived in a cave system. Maybe it's just a community of whatever. Outcasts, like, that, that lived in a cave system and would come out and, and maybe, do, who knows, but. Yeah. I still would like to have like some kind of like description, but yeah. aside from being that they're pale and the sun hurts their eyes, that's about it. And yeah. they're wretches. Because to me, so. just wretches means thin, frail. Weak. Yeah. But some, and there's, there's other articles and stuff, but like, as you kind of look through it, there's nothing that really says, okay, this is how, how tall they are. And this is what they look like. You got, I think some liberties being taken because there's one, like if you go to North Carolina ghost.com, they describe them as, a race of small uh, small men who, according to Cherokee legend, once lived in the southern Appalachians. Mm-hmm. They were said to be physically very different from the Cherokee, being bearded and having perfectly pale white skin. And they were called moon-eyed because they were unable to see during the daytime, <coughs> excuse me, and their sensitive eyes being blinded by the sun. For that reason, they were strictly nocturnal. They lived in the other underground caverns. Oh, wow. The moon-eyed people of Murphy, North Carolina, from one of my favorite websites, Roadside yep. America. And it's not that, I mean, well, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> but, um, th- see, and I'm going, trying to find descriptions of them and similar to like what you said, yeah. you know, and the number one thing that keeps popping out in what I'm looking at is subterranean people. Yeah. So are they the, the Kentucky goblins? I mean, who knows, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> if you look at Cherokee cosmology, Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a universe where humans share the world with, with each other, along with non-human and supernatural peoples. Yeah. And so it's, it's a mixture of different things. And well, according to this, what's the interesting part is that the Moon-Eyed people are never described as being supernatural, but being remembered as another group of humans that were physically very different from the Native Americans. Yeah. And I just so. found a photo, or not a photo, a photo of sculptures where the Cherokee depicted them. These sculptures were found in the 1840s, but just recently went on display in Murphy, North Carolina. Yeah. In 2015. These things look like grays, y'all. Except they have a nose. I mean, where's the beard? Yeah. Their heads so, are all super round. Yep. The uh, weird egg head thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. So, if they do have beards, right? Yeah. And they are short. And they're super pale skin. They're white. Now they start to sound more like dwarves or something like that. You'd be like little people. Yeah. But if they're just a race of, you know, people that are genetically not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But, I mean, there's a lot of theories about the moon-eyed people. Mm-hmm. You know, like the they're the ancestors of the albinos that Lionel Wafer encountered during his um, Kuna people of Panama. Well, yeah. how did they get all the way here? Yeah, they don't really explain that part. Were they taken? Um, you know, how, how would you? I don't know. Yeah, because my thing is the Panama, you know, the pre-Columbian, pre whatever, pre-Chicoan cultures, things like that. Yeah. All of those, they went north and they went west. They didn't necessarily go east because of the weather. Yeah. Uh, they're not, you know, the weather was not good for them. Mm. So why would anything from pa- Panama, Mexico, South America come east? Yeah. And this is pretty early times. This yeah. isn't like, you know. Oh, wow. So, yeah, apparently that there's a museum in Murphy, North Carolina, the Cherokee County Historical Museum. Yeah. I want to go there now. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. here's the fun fact. And just in case you're still listening to the Creep Geeks podcast, we do plan on doing uh, an episode here pretty soon on something pretty interesting out there. And uh, 
I don't want to say it's the Judah Color Rock, but it is, and it's out in that particular area. <laughs> and one of the places we're going to stop after we go check out the Judah Color Rock, and we'll talk about that in great and agonizing detail one day in the he- very near future, is we're going to stop and take some pictures of these little rounded faced moon eyed peoples yeah. and put them on our website. So there you go. Yep. See, and it was weird. But these wretches they expelled. Why would they call them wretches? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I could understand like a colonist or yeah. a settler using the word wretches, but these these settlers that the, the Cherokee interacted with had a very good relationship with them. Yeah. So they would have portrayed their words more honestly. Cherokee mm-hmm. don't use wretches unless they needed to. You're, you yeah. know, use it's, that. Well, it's type probably of, been translated. They yeah. probably, you know, they probably said something terrible, and wretches is the closest word. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. And and the reason I say that is because I've read other descriptions of you know the Cherokee describing other tribes. Right. You know, even tribes they didn't get along with. So there we go. So, we don't know if the Moon Eye people are like a natural gene mutation or a different branch of man or goblins. And the reason we brought up the goblins yeah. is because we've started watching Hellier. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, it's uh, for a documentary that you can watch on YouTube. All five parts are like an hour long or so. For free. Totally worth watching. Yeah. And you should. And there'll be a link. Yeah. Or you can just basically go to YouTube and type in Hellier and you'll find it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we got conflicting descriptions of the moon eyed people, pale skinned, pale hair, beards, blue eyes, and avoid underground or avoid light by living underground. Yeah. Um, some say they lived in round dwellings and they emerged at nighttime. I don't know, but see, there's also red hair giants that are in the West too. Yeah. And a Cherokee drove those out as well. Right. And it also says the Cherokee legend says that they drove the moon eyed people West and took care of the giants out west. So I don't know what's going on here. Were the Cherokee like the bouncers of North America? Because that's what it no, sounds like. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't really know. Yeah. You know, because we do when we have, you know, do- talk about giants in the in the Southwest and all that sort of thing. I think everybody is pretty much cool with each other until something bad happens, or you try to like eat somebody. Yeah, <laughs> and then it becomes a thing. Because uh, the story we talked about was it was a a tribe of Indians. It was a group of Indians. It wasn't just. Cherokee, but it was a group of tribes, yeah, different tribes, that got together to take out these super giants that were living in the caves that mm-hmm. would come out and steal people and go eat them. Ooh. Yeah. So where they drove them back in the cave, uh, set the cave on fire, and then basically dropped all the rocks down in front so burned them all alive, all these huge yeah. giants, you know, between seven and 12 foot tall giants with the double rows of teeth and the extra fingers on the hands and all that stuff that were actually eating, you know, cannibalism. So they're actually eating the people and they took care of them. So Hmm. I don't know. We'll talk about that in the future too, but um, I don't know. I would like to, I wish there was more descriptions. I wish there was descriptions that, that sort of tied the moon eyed people to the goblins that we've been talking about. Yeah. And this whole hellier thing is making me stay awake at night, making me a little nervous about hiking in certain areas. Because um, these could just be a forgotten race of little people. Or, right? Because yeah. with every giant race you hear about, like a, a forgotten race of giant people, there's also the little people. Yeah. Lots of little people. And every culture has the little people. So, mm. I don't know. We'll see. Nuts. <laughs> kind of excited, though. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. And then we have a couple different things coming up on the Creepy Geeks podcast. We, we're going to have some interviews. With some local like-minded people. That's coming up. It'll be a surprise when that happens. Yep. It'll be good. There's also the possibility of a an event that's going to be happening here. It should be pretty interesting. An event that you could actually watch from the comfort of your own home. Ooh. Coming up pretty soon. Um, uh, I gave sort of a, an indication that we'll be going out and checking out Judicola Rock. And we will. That's going to be very interesting. That's going to be a complete podcast onto itself. Along with whatever video we can scrap together because sadly, it seems to be that it's eroding with time and going away. and want to catch it before it completely goes. Yeah. And so we'll talk about the theories with Judicola. Uh, possibility of some nighttime investigations in certain places. There's a lot of great stuff coming up on the Creepy Geeks podcast. You should definitely stick around and listen for the future. But other than that, that's about all I have. Yeah. So, what about you? Uh, no, just uh, 
Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play. Give us a rating. Give us a like. Um, our Instagram's growing. We've been posting on that regularly. You can still pick up t-shirts off of our Teespring website. Yep. And if you don't see the shirt you want, you can click on a shirt you like and modify it. Yes. So You can select different colors and sizes and stuff. Yeah. And if you don't see a shirt you like and you really want one really bad, send us an email and we'll see what we can do for you. Yeah. We're not saying we're sending out t-shirts. Yeah, we're no. saying we can maybe we can, modify the design for yeah. you. And if you want to so, support the podcast, but you don't actually want to do anything, which is okay, and next time you go to Amazon, if you go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Cheap Geek, which is our sister channel, yeah, um, whatever you buy, we get a little little percentage. Now, if you'd like to... It doesn't cook. cost you anything at all. Yeah. And, you know, it helps us buy coffee and snacks. The power of the show. <laughs> yeah. And if you would like to contact us on the show... You can do that through contact at creepgeeks.com. That's the best place to reach us for any business-related inquiries. If you want to comment about the show, it's going to be greg at creepgeeks.com or omi at creepgeeks.com. And we'll put all the links for everything we talked about in the show notes. Be sure to like the Facebook page. It's been growing. And join the Facebook group. If you see us on the road, you're listening to the podcast, whatever, you see something Creep Geeks related... Hop onto the Facebook group, join, we'll let you in, and, you know, say hi. Yeah. If you actually see us out and about, come over and say hello. Yeah. Just don't be weird about it. <laughs> no, well, I kind of bring it up because we were out hanging out with the M&D, Paranormal, because mm-hmm. we were discussing some things and having a little dinner, and we actually had some people come up and talk to us and ask us some questions. And they were just sort of, like, sneaking up to us, you know, looking at us. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they kind of worked up and was like, hey. Are you the guys with the big white van? They were talking about the albino <laughs> rhino, right? And we're like, yeah. And then they asked us a couple of questions. It was pretty cool. We gave them some business cards and stuff. We should have gave them some stickers, but I didn't think about it. I didn't have any in my wallet. Yeah. So. And so they asked us some questions about the podcast and what we were doing and all that sort of thing. But if you see us out there and you know it's us, come over and say hello. Yeah. Just don't be creepy and like eyeballs from a distance because it was just really weird. I'm like, what are they doing? They, are were, they, gonna... they were kids, okay? Well, so. I mean, they were like in their 20s. They're not they're like little kids, but... Yeah, so. It's a good thing. So anyway, that's about all I got. So mm-hmm. Come over and say hey. It's, it's, it's all right. But stick around because we have some interesting things coming up this year. 2019 is going to be good. And we look forward to being able to interact with you. So there you go. Mm-hmm. That's it for me. Is that it for you? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.